Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Usalli Wa Usallam ala Sayyid al Awalim wa Al-Akhirin Nabiyana Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and peace and blessings be constantly showered upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, the master of the first and the last, and upon his family and companions and all those who call to his way to the day of judgment. My beloved brothers and sisters, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I sincerely pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for the safety of this world. Uh, in 2020, we are going through amazing changes uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would spare the children and the elderly and all those who are in need uh, during this pandemic and would give the Muslim world the ability to rise to the surface and to show the world that the real solution uh, is within the revelation. It's the lifestyle revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of the prophets and to our last prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And so this time is, we could say, a time of isolation. And as the Muslims and the rest of the world are forced to stay within their homes, it is a chance for us to reflect. It is a chance for us to look into ourselves and not just be caught up with the things that are happening around us on a daily basis. And so self-introspection and looking inside oneself also should connect us to the past. Because by connected to the past, we gain clarity in the present. And people who do not understand their past will actually be confused in the present. And so we find that in the book of scripture of the Muslims, the last testament, Al-Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed one third of the revelation in a historical form. Al-Qasas. These are the stories of the prophets. These are the stories of the nations that came before us. And it is through these stories that we gain valuable lessons to help us in the present day. In Surah to Yusuf, verse 11, Allah tells us, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ That in their stories is wisdom, great lessons for those who would reflect. And so the history, the stories that are being given to us are not being given just to read but to benefit from. And so in looking at our history and looking at the world, it's crucial for Muslims to understand the background that we are coming from. And I want to focus in this series, inshallah, on the African continent, and especially East Africa, to look at this um, mysterious part of the world, misunderstood. And I can say honestly, that East Africa and Africa as a whole is one of the most misrepresented, misunderstood places on the planet Earth. And so to break through the ignorance, to break through the barriers of confusion, we want to go back in time to understand what happened in this continent and to put it in perspective so that we could understand more about the people who are living in this region today. Many European historians, when they look at Africa, they write about a dark, backward continent. They write about ignorant people, and some of the top historians have even said Africa has done nothing for the onward flow of civilization. There couldn't be a greater lie than this, or a greater distortion. The reality is, if we go back and try to understand Africa, not as an isolated continent, but actually as part of uh, a huge portion of the land mass of the earth. We understand that over 55 million years ago or so, according to scientists, there were tectonic plates shifting. There were major changes that went on in the geography of the world. And the African continent split away from what is now known as Arabia. And the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa then formed. 25 million years or so, with tectonic shifts going on, a great valley formed. It is called the Great Rift Valley. And that valley in the northern part reaches all the way to the Jordan Valley 
in the, in the Middle East and goes all the way down to Mozambique in the south. And so this is a large system, a large ecological system, a valley system. And it is this area that we want to look at, and especially um, with the formation of the Red Sea and with the movement of the currents and the ocean, we're looking at East Africa as being from, from the top of the Red Sea all the way down to Mozambique. And the inland form of East Africa would be um, not only Egypt and the Sudan, but it would also stretch down to Ethiopia, to Uganda, to Kenya, to Tanzania, all the way down to Mozambique. That whole region there is what we are considering to be uh, East Africa. And it's important for us um, to have that perspective uh, when we are looking at history because nothing is static. And as time changes, the earth changes, circumstances changes, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to make revelation, continues to give us information. But we are the ones who have to give perspective to the changes and understand what is going on in our lives today. So again, if we go back in time, we find that the oldest uh, remains or, or records of Homo sapiens is actually coming out of that Eastern Africa, Southern Africa region, where people from thousands of years ago, Homo sapiens, then migrated uh, north and then moved uh, from the highlands of Ethiopia and Uganda and Kenya, they moved down. Now it's important, when you look at the map of Africa, you would think that the Nile River flows from north to south. But in actuality, according to the geography, it is flowing from south north. So the upper part of the Nile is the southern region. And it is from there that the early human beings in Africa then migrated and finally reached what is now known today as the Nile Valley. Some historians go back to 17,000 years that the Nile Valley actually was, uh, uh, had the ability to be cultivated. But we know um, that around 10,000 BC, that the early people coming out of uh, that Eastern African region settled into the Nile Valley and began to organize themselves and to cultivate crops. And so they developed the early city-states of the Nile Valley. And we have uh, solid information that uh, by 3500 BC, uh, there were a number of states in what is now known as the, the Sudan, northern Sudan, and southern Egypt, uh, the Nubia region. And <clears throat> these states um, were known as Taseti. And we have proof of 12 kings uh, who, that, that recorded themselves and, and, and were living in this area with their people. And it is from these civilizations that the people, again, continued to follow the Nile. They followed it down. So this is the upper Egypt uh, area, and they followed the Nile uh, north. So they're going down uh, north. And they migrated until they reached the delta. And that is what is known as Lower Egypt. And so Upper Egypt was that... Uh, Nubian area, the area of Sudan and uh, southern Egypt, and lower, e lower Egypt was the Delta uh, region. And it is reported that around the year 3200 BC, that a great leader whose name was Namir, he united Upper and Lower Egypt. And Namir, <clears throat> who in some cases is called Menes, this was a great political move. And we could say it is one of the greatest unifications that happened in the ancient world. And so he united Upper and Lower Egypt, and we still have uh, a bust, uh, a, a, a sculpture of his face. So we can say that Menes, the great leader uh, of Egypt, he united Upper and Lower Egypt. And he was able to bring about this unification and bring together the strength uh, of the upper section and the lower section. It is through this unification that the ancient Egyptians 
uh, sometimes known as the Anu people who originally came there, that they were able to develop an amazing society. And uh, one of the Egyptian uh, historians, uh, Manito, he actually records 30 dynasties, over 561 uh, different kings, who we now know as the Pharaoh or the Fir'aun in Arabic. <clears throat> and the ancient Egyptians were able to develop the early, one of the earliest writing systems, the hieroglyphics. They developed uh, physics and math and, and, and philosophy. They had a calendar going back thousands of years. And because of this development, they were able to control the Nile. Remember, the Nile is flowing down, and this Nile is the gift of Egypt. It is the gift of the Sudan, this whole area. So the Nile flows into this desert-like region. It turns green, agriculture grows, and the ancient um, Nubian Egyptians were able to subjugate the river, to control it, and to send it out uh, into the different agricultural areas in order to develop uh, their civilization. And so by the year 2650 BC, this is what is called the Old Kingdom uh, of Egypt. It is around that time that they built the step pyramid in Saqqara. This step pyramid is an amazing structure that is still standing up until today. It was built for the pharaoh whose name was Zoser. And um, I had the opportunity to go below uh, the pyramid and to look at the different chambers and to see that they were doing complicated brain surgery, that they knew uh, decimal numbers, they physics, math, um, they had an amazing uh, understanding uh, of, of how to deal with structure uh, and, and, and architecture. So this society now continues to develop. And by the year 2500 BC, approximately, the ancient Egyptians uh, build the uh, Great Pyramid at Giza. This pyramid, uh, up until today, is one of the wonders of the world. Just imagine this, this great pyramid uh, of Giza uh, that is built, it had approximately 2,300,000 blocks of granite. Some of these blocks were uh, a num two tons. The blocks were actually cut out in Aswan, which is in the south, and they were taken up. Remember, they're going down. They were taken from Aswan, which is in the south of Egypt, all the way to the area of Giza, which is uh, near, near that delta. And they were put into perfect position to develop this amazing structure. It's, it's shocking that this pyramid, built by African people, by the ancient East Africans, uh, was the tallest building in the world up until the 19th century. It's shocking, 2,300,000 blocks of granite. It's shocking that the corners of the Great Pyramid are perfect right angles, that the corners uh, go exactly north, south, east, and west. And there is more granite, there is more stone in this building than all of the churches and cathedrals in England from the time of Christ until now. It's also shocking that it was not slavery as we have been taught because the ancient Egyptians saw it as national service. And it was actually done during the time of Khufu, again, an, an African uh, pharaoh. And um, he developed this pyramid, and we see that it was practical science. Now, just to have the right perspective, because especially for Muslims, Christians, and Jews, uh, there is an understanding of the prophet Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, who travels from Iraq uh, through uh, Syria and then down into uh, Egypt. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, his time is approximately around 1640 BC. So we need to put this into perspective. If you look back at the Steppe Pyramid 2650 BC, you look at the Great Pyramid uh, done much later, 2500 BC or so, and then now, um, Ibrahim salam is coming in much later than that. If you look at the time of Moses, or Musa salam, he is coming approximately around 
1525 BC. So that means it is uh, over a thousand years uh, after the time of the building of the Great Pyramids, and so it was not done by slaves. It was not the Pharaoh beating the children of Israel and, and they're carrying stones on their head. The pyramids were built long before Abraham himself actually entered into Egypt, long before Musa salam was born. And so uh, we need to have the right perspective. Even greater than that in terms of perspective, the Greek civilization, which many people uh, say is the basis of civilization in Egypt and in Africa, Greek civilization kicked in somewhere around the 8th century, which is the 700s. So if you look at that, the ancient Egyptians developed their early pyramids 2,000 years before the Greeks even started their civilization. And the ancient Greeks were not racist. The ancient Greeks wrote about their civilization and they said we got it from the ancient Egyptians and they were dark-skinned people with woolly hair. And so the reality is, is that with the development of calendars, with the development of hieroglyphics, with the development of uh, architecture and, and science on this level, we can safely say that this part of East Africa was one of the most important places on the face of the planet Earth. 30 dynasties, 561 kings, so many things happened, so many incidents happened. Even the concept of the belief in one God, because the Quran is telling us that prophets and messengers were sent to every nation and every tribe. And so therefore, at some point in time, prophets and messengers were also sent into the Nile Valley region. And so the Pharaoh that we know, that comes in our Quranic texts and we find uh, in the biblical text as well, that is probably the son of Ramses or his grandson. And again, that is coming long after the building of the pyramids, long after the basic development of uh, Egyptian society. And so again now, looking at our East African structure, from the top of the Red Sea all the way down to Mozambique, we go to the year 1473 BC. It is um, around this time that the daughter of the Pharaoh Tutmos I, um, she became the queen of Egypt. Hatshepsut was her name. And she married her half-brother Tutmos II, who was 12 years old. And she virtually was um, the, the regent of Egypt. Eventually, she completely took over Egypt. And so Hatshepsut was a very famous woman uh, in ancient Africa and the ancient world. And she did a number of very powerful things. People remember uh, Hatshepsut uh, for two major reasons. One was the fact that uh, she built uh, a beautiful temple structure and a city structure, um, and this is uh, uh, Diyar al-Bahar. And um, she organized uh, this area and, and, and built this beautiful structure. And you can see on the walls, I had a chance to go to the temple of Hatshepsut. And you can see on the walls the reliefs. They actually drew pictures on the walls. And some of it remains up until today. And um, there's hieroglyphs on the walls. And I looked at the walls and I saw a discussion happening about trading going on between the ancient Egyptians and the people of a land called Punt. Punt land was to the south. And it is, you can see the Egyptians now meeting the people of Punt and a, a, a brisk trading going on in, in this area. So Hatshepsut was known for using the Red Sea and then traveling down uh, to the bottom of the Red Sea to what is now uh, the Horn of Africa. It would be now the present day Djibouti, Somalia, uh, this area down in there. And this was a land that was so important to the Egyptians at that point in time that they called it the land of the gods. And they said that in this land, there are so many products that can be used for religious purposes in their poetry and their writings. 
They looked at um, Punt as a type of mythical land, a mysterious land. And some say even the mother of Hatshepsut Hathor, that she came from that region. And so a brisk trade was going on. Some of the interesting products that were coming out of Punt was gold, frankincense, ivory, ebony, leopard skins, also uh, aromatic uh, resins, live animals, fragrant woods, eye makeup for cosmetics, cinnamon, copper, carved amulets, naphtha, myrrh with your frankincense. And so, so you can see some very important products. For religious purposes, you'll see that in many parts of the ancient world, they were using frankincense and myrrh, which was coming from uh, southern Arabia, Hadramaut, in this region. And uh, Punt was a type of trading center. And so the people of that area were uh, gathering the products that were coming from southern Arabia, from the resin uh, of the trees. This is the frankincense. There's also a type of frankincense which is gummy, and you can chew it. So it's like the first chewing gum. Uh, cosmetics. So think about this, the level of society going now. Cosmetics. Beautiful, ar you know, uh, 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 itta. Aromatic smells. Perfumes. And so this is a, a magical land and a, a very important center, which today we would call the Horn of Africa. And so <clears throat> drawn on the walls of Hatshepsut up until today is this connection to show what was happening in uh, East Africa, moving from the Red Sea and then taking us south. Later on, uh, Egypt was conquered uh, by the Persians. And um, we find that although there was a connection made by the ancient Egyptians between the Red Sea, they used the Nile, okay, and they were able to connect uh, the Nile to the Mediterranean. So the Red Sea to the Nile to the Mediterranean. But it was uh, later on in the time of Darius the Great. Uh, this is the Persian uh, uh, leader who, who conquered that area, that they were able to really develop that. And so this enabled the Greeks and the Romans to come from the Mediterranean region. When we look at our map again, and we see the connection between the upper part of the Red Sea going down to the Horn of Africa, and then down into East Africa itself, along the coastline to Mozambique. We recognize that there were a number of civilizations. One of the great civilizations um, that comes in uh, our ancient texts is the empire of Aksum. And this uh, came into prominence from around 100 AD to about 940 uh, AD. And, um, it was basically uh, Eritrea and uh, northern Ethiopia, but at different points. It included the Sudan, uh, Yemen, uh, Somalia. It actually stretched out uh, at different points uh, because of the achievements that were made by the people of Axum. They developed a high technology. And the proof of that is the fact that the largest obelisks in the world are not found in Egypt, although they have the obelisk. And the obelisk is that straight structure, that granite structure, uh, one piece of granite uh, sticking up uh, to the sky. And when I visited the area, um, the guide actually uh, told me on the side, because I asked him the real reality of the obelisk, he said it was a sundial. And it's actually something which was being used in their astronomy uh, and their math. And so, the largest obelisk in the world is not in Egypt, uh, but it is in present-day Ethiopia, which formerly was uh, Axum. You'll find obelisks all over the world. The Europeans stole some of the obelisks. The Americans put one in Washington, D.C. There are obelisks uh, in France. Of course, they have the Eiffel Tower. Uh, there's obelisks all over the world. And again, this is um, trying to match that technology uh, coming out of East Africa. Imagine somebody saying, that Africa has done nothing for the onward flow of civilization. When the largest building in the world, the tallest building in the world, up until the 19th century, was in Africa. It was in Egypt, the Great Pyramid. 
and when the largest obelisks in the world were in Ethiopia. So the ancient Aksumites uh, that we could call Ethiopians, although it was dealing with uh, a greater territory, the ancient uh, Aksumite dynasty was also known for its powerful armies. They had developed amazing formations uh, with their army and, and weaponry, and they were able to harness the use of elephants. Uh, and these elephants changed the structure of warfare. It's like uh, in World War I, the tanks are coming in, and uh, they were being developed. And then later on, uh, helicopter gunships. Uh, and now there are drones. And so technologies um, change the relationship of people uh, in wars. And because of this technology and this power, the, the great visionary called Mani, and he lived in uh, Babylon and Persia. And um, this uh, famous visionary of ancient times, um, he, and it's coming in around the 3rd century uh, AD or so, he considered that there were great, four great powers uh, in the world. And at that time, he considered Persia, the Sassanid dynasty, to be one of the great powers, also the Roman Empire. The third were three kingdoms of China, and the fourth was the empire of Aksum. And so East Africa, East African people, were considered to be one of the most powerful groups of people on the face of the planet Earth. There are many different traces uh, of the civilization uh, there in East Africa. And it's interesting to note that the followers of, of Isa salam, of Jesus, um, when they were under persecution and Jesus was raised, they had to migrate to different areas. And it is reported that Mark actually reached the Nile. And so the teachings of, of, of Jesus, you could call the real Orthodox Christianity, the original religion, went up south. And the people there uh, developed a type of um, pure Christianity which is actually closer to the original teachings of Isa alayhi salam. And we remember that he was actually Jewish, and all of his followers were Jewish. They were following the Old Testament. And this um, revised form that came with Isa alayhi salam, uh, it went up the Nile until it reached uh, the southern part of Egypt and Sudan and went all the way into Ethiopia. And so the Aksumites uh, accepted Christianity. And they were a powerful uh, dynasty, and they were linked with the Roman Empire. So in the same way that there are diplomatic messages uh, between different powers in the world today, that there is a type of United Nations, and, and there are different agreements that are made between world powers uh, today, in the ancient times, there was also understanding between the world powers. And the Romans were in direct communication uh, with the Aksumites of Ethiopia. And it is reported that around 520 AD that uh, King Caleb uh, of the um, Aksumites, of the Ethiopians, he sent an expedition into Yemen. And this is because a Jewish king by the name of Dhu Nuas, uh, he had been persecuting uh, people and um, torturing people. And so he sent an army there and he eventually uh, defeated the Nuas, uh, who rode into the ocean, never to be found again. And the Aksumites conquered Yemen. And so they took over that whole region there. And it's interest, it is interesting to Muslims because this story appears in the Quran uh, in the chapter called Buruj. So it is in this uh, uh, chapter, Wasama Idatul Buruj. In this uh, mighty chapter of the Quran, it tells us Qutila Ashab al that the people of the trench, uh, these people were killed. And it gives um, a, a beautiful rendition uh, of this story and what happened at that time. And so um, the Christian Aksumites getting a message and in unity with the Romans, uh, at that time Byzantium, uh, they conquered the region. So the Christians had a block going up the Nile and all the way over into Yemen, 
uh, into this area. And it was a struggle that went on between the Christians and the Persians. Because again, the Persians considered the Ethiopians and the Romans uh, to be their greatest enemies. The Chinese were sort of landlocked uh, in the eastern side. And so a power struggle went on. And it is from this power struggle that the Ethiopian general Abraha uh, was able to seize power uh, in Yemen, in this area, and he built a kulais, he built a type of cathedral or church in Yemen. It was defiled uh, by one of the, of the Arabs who was in the area because the Arabs had the Kaaba uh, in Mecca. And it is from there um, that Abraha made the decision to attack Mecca. The rest has been recorded uh, in the history of Islam and in world history that Abraha did go forward to conquer Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed in the, the chapter uh, of the, 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 the birds, Surah Al-Fil, and speaking about uh, these uh, small birds uh, which flew in the air and they dropped down stones uh, upon um, the elephants. Because remember, Abraha went north with elephants. And so with the elephants going north, uh, and reaching into the Meccan area, the Arabs at that time had no power to stop them. And it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent uh, birds carrying small stones and dropped them from high altitudes and it crushed the army. And it's interesting to note also that um, historians also show that along with the stones, um, that hit the elephants, there was also a virus. There was also a plague that broke out. And that virus then decimated. And as Allah said, And so they were so destroyed, their bodies were so destroyed and diseased that they were like the cud, they were like grass that is chewed up in the mouth um, of a cow and then spit down. And so the virus, an army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along with the birds, we are facing one of these armies today with the COVID-19. And again, history is repeating itself. And we see that East Africa uh, is a venue of major events that are, that are taking place in the world to the point where that year is called in history uh, Amil Fiel, it is the year of the elephants. It is a crucial year. So the ancient lands uh, of Egypt, uh, of Nubia, of Aksum, now Ethiopia, Eritrea, were connected all the way down that valley region. They were connected to the south. They were also connected to the north with the extension of the Red Sea going to the Nile and to the Mediterranean. So the business was now briskly going uh, from that Mediterranean region all the way through to the point where the Quran, again, in the chapter of Quraysh, it is speaking about Rihla Tashita Iwal Saif, that the, the journeys that the Arabs would take in the winter and in the summer. And it is recorded that the Arabs of Hadramaut and there is the Himyar society and great societies in Yemen and in Hadramaut, that the Arabs would get the uh, resin, the frankincense, the myrrh, the spices, even there was coffee. So many products came from that area. They would take these spices and, and they would ship them to different places. We saw how Puntland, how Somalia was like a trading house uh, for these uh, aromatic spices. And we also can see that the Arabs would use the Arabian Peninsula now, and this is now running parallel to the Red Sea trade, they would go overland and they would take caravans and they would travel from Yemen to Mecca all the way to Gaza on the Mediterranean, into Syria, into these regions there, and they would trade and, and, and barter and bring back uh, products and carry them south. So brisk trade routes were going. And <clears throat> the frankincense and myrrh 
that came out of Hadramaut and out of Yemen, and then through Puntland, Somalia, up into Egypt. This was able to filter to different parts of the world, and people in ancient religions, in the Mediterranean, in Asia, throughout the world, people wanted to have this beautiful smells, because that frankincense, um, that luban, that, that, that smell that comes, it, it purifies the air. So this region was considered to be an area of great riches. And it was connected not only uh, to the north, but it was also connected to the south. So we could say that East Africa in ancient times was a connected region. It was a region that actually reached all the way up to the Jordan Valley. But for our intents and purposes, we can say from the Red Sea, it went all the way down. And you find on both sides of the Red Sea, whether it be in Egypt or in Sudan, Djibouti, Somalia, and on the other side, which is Arabia and Yemen, the people were very similar, the languages were similar, the culture was similar, and trade was very brisk. And so we find not only physical connections between the people, but also linguistic connections. And so the ancient Semitic languages, there is the Semitic languages of the ancient Arabs, Al-Arab al-Ba'ida. There are the ancient perishing Arabs, whose languages in Ad and Tamud and Mada'in Saleh, they are dead languages today. Then there is Al-Arab al-Ariba, there is the original Arabs, you could say, um, who were, or the base Arabs, the, the pure Arab stock coming out of Yemen. And then there is Al-Arab al-Mustaraba. And these are the people who learned to speak Arabic uh, later on. And we see as Arabic uh, went north to Syria and to Lebanon and Egypt and Morocco and other parts of what is now known uh, as the Arab world. So these Semitic languages actually were connected to East Africa as well. And we see in ancient Ethiopia, Amharic, which is um, a Semitic tongue, which is spoken in uh, Ethiopia. We see Jewish people called Falasha Jews who are living in Ethiopia. We see uh, languages they call Hamitic languages or languages which are related to the Semitic, Semitic languages being spoken in uh, East, East Africa, in, in, in Egypt, in parts of the Sudan, in Eritrea. We find this linguistic connection. We also find uh, the connection in their coinage and, 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 and the connection in um, their understanding of the world. And so, so much was there in the ancient world. So much of a connection. And even when we go back into our uh, biblical literature, we see the story of uh, uh, Solomon, Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, and the famous King Solomon, who thought he was the most powerful person on earth, and then he heard about a queen in the south. And this is the story of Bilqis, or the Queen of Sheba, uh, whose base was in Ethiopia and in Yemen. Remember that connection that is there. And Suleiman alayhi salam, because he was given the power to control even the jinn uh, and to, to connect with the birds and to connect with insects. And so he was able to bring the throne of Bilqis all the way uh, from Ethiopia, all the way into up into what is now Palestine, into this region there. He was able to bring that throne. He was able to make that connection uh, with Bilqis. And um, this is an amazing understanding. Up until today, if you go to what is known as Aksum, and this is in Ethiopia, Highland Ethiopia, you will find um, a temple there, the, the Church of, 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 of St. Mary, and you will find uh, the, a special place where the Ethiopians believe is the Ark of the Covenant. And so it is believed that um, Suleiman alayhi salam, that with the ancient records and, 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 and the scrolls, and there was a chest, and there the power that was given to humanity through these testaments, these early testaments, was manifest uh, in this Ark of the Covenant. And according to the Ethiopians, uh, uh, Suleiman gave it to his son Menelik, 
who took it to, e to, to Ethiopia, and it is still resting within that area in Aksum. Allah knows best. I had the opportunity to visit there in Aksum, and I reached the place where the Ark of the Covenant uh, is lying. There is a priest at the door, and there's another priest who's living on the inside. And people are so serious. The Ethiopian priests are so serious about this. They are living in a type of i'tikaf, a type of isolation, a, a spiritual isolation. And they are constantly doing their repentance. And they are protecting it. And the, and the one who lives inside never comes out his whole life. And when he's about to die, he uh, brings his successor. He appoints a successor, and that person comes in. And the Ethiopians refused anybody, even the Queen of England, to go inside to see the Ark of the Covenant. I asked about it to historians, especially to Palestinian uh, historians, who really were deep into that ancient history, and they don't believe it's the actual Ark, but they believe there is something of value inside, something from the ancient times. And so... The ancient is connected to the present. And people up until today have that connection to the ancient world. There's no separation really between what is now Arabia on the eastern side and Africa uh, on the western side of the Red Sea. It was all originally part of one continent. And when it separated, the people coming in moved onto both sides. And because it is so close, when you're in Djibouti, you can see Yemen on a clear day. So the region is very close, and the people are close. They intermarried. The trade was brisk. Uh, con conquests were going on constantly. And this is crucial for us in understanding East Africa and looking at its connection with the ancient world. And we pray and we hope that we will be able to continue our understanding to go on to understand our East Africa, remember from the top of the Red Sea to the Horn of Africa, and then down the coastline to Mozambique, and then inland to the societies living in Tanzania and Malawi, going up to Uganda, to Kenya, to Ethiopia, to Somalia, uh, to the Sudan, to Egypt, that whole region there. We want to look at that region to understand what developed further south, what happened uh, in the history that can give us lessons for today. This is so important when we look at East Africa. There is a tendency for people today, when you mention Africa, they think about a dust bowl, they think about refugees, they think about a state of confusion. And no doubt, East Africa, um, and the Sahara region have been struck with climactic changes. But what we have to understand is that there are resilient human beings living in this area who have carried on a tradition that goes back to ancient times. And I can safely say that that tradition, which was coming out of the highlands of East Africa and which went into the great Nile Valley, which traveled along the Red Sea and moved over to Puntland and then later went down the Swahili coast, the coast of East Africa, that that civilization is one of the most important early civilizations in human existence. And it is affecting us up until today. The past is connected to the present. And although people may be suffering at one point, it does not take away from the contributions that the people of any region have done to the world. And that is what is being a, a, a true you, a human. That is what is using our intelligence, that we are able to connect the past to the present and then look to the future. So let us reflect on the past. Let us look at the achievements of all of the peoples of the world. Put it into proper perspective look at the situation today and what is happening in the world, recognizing the achievement of all human beings throughout this planet, and then connect it to our projection for the future. And maybe, inshallah, we will be able to develop 
a type of society where those who have freely give to those who do not have. Because as they say, and the Arabs would say, yawman leka wa yawman alayk. There is one day for you, and there is another day that will be against you. So I pray that uh, Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless the people of uh, ancient East Africa, would bless all of those righteous ones from the beginning of time. As I leave you in peace with these thoughts, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.